Welcome once again to EWTN's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, your host. Our guest author today is Father Herbert Neba, and the book is The Way of the Cross with St. John Paul II, published by our friends at Our Sunday Visitor, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog, naturally, EWTNRC.com. And welcome, Father Herbert. Thank you very much. To EWTN's Bookmark. Uh, some of our viewers might have seen you uh, when you were on Life on the Rock with the Friars. Uh, so give us a little bit of a background. This is, uh, what, the second book you've actually uh, written? Yes, this is the second book. The first was uh, based on the missionary who worked in our major seminary for over 40 years. It's titled The Life and Work of Harry Peters, Amare et Severe. This second book, uh, I wrote it in the context of the two assignments I've had since my priestly ordination in 2014. The first two years, I was at the Institute of Theology uh, John Paul II Institute of Theology in Boya in my home diocese, okay. where I designed a course on the life and teaching of John Paul II. Mm -hmm. And after two years, I moved over to, I was assigned to St. John Paul II Major Seminary, mm -hmm. now teaching philosophy to seminarians. And so this work is a, a product of six years or so of teaching and reflecting uh, on the life of John Paul II, both in the context of classroom mm -hmm. and also private spiritual reading. Now, was your connection and your focus on John Paul II because you happened to go to schools and institutes that were related to him, or was there something about him? Um, you know, I know you re refer to the fact that I think your parents saw him when he first came and whatever. Yes. Uh, or was it something else uh, prior to your working there? Yeah, Pope John Paul II visited Cameroon two times, in 1985 and 1995. Right. In 1985, I was not yet born, right. but I grew up in a family, and my parents recounted the incident because it was such a, uh, an important trip, and several pilgrims from all over Cameroon made it to the four centers of the ecclesiastical provinces at the time where he visited. Mm -hmm. So uh, first, my first contact with John Paul II is a family setup. Mm -hmm. The second was the fact that when I started a major seminary formation in 2005, he just died. Mm -hmm. And so I started reading more about him. And then the last thing which uh, I should say actually gave me an orientation was the fact that after my priestly ordination, uh, on the day of my Thanksgiving Mass, first Thanksgiving mm -hmm. Mass as a priest on the 27th of April 2014 was the day he was canonized. Right. Mm -hmm. Now you, f you focused on the way of the cross with St. John Paul II. Was that because that was important to him or important to you or important to both of you? Both because it was important to him. John Paul II prayed the way of the cross every Friday of his life mm -hmm. and every day during Lent. Now, back home in the province I grew, the Bamenda Ecclesiastical Province, the Way of the Cross is a very important spiritual rendezvous. Mm -hmm. During Lent, we pray it every weekday and also during other spiritual exercises. So uh, the attempt was uh, trying to give more impetus to this division, which has impacted me since from my youth and also my vocation. And I love storytelling. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the context of the course I had taught on John Paul II, I was able to pick out stories and witnesses, uh, witness testimonies about John Paul II to be able to give new touch to this traditional devotion of the church. So was it your idea to write this book and how did you go about getting OSV to publish it? Uh, I wrote it and then I made a book proposal. Uh, I contacted other press houses, but our Sunday visitor was the first to accept right. after about some months. Right, so, no, that's, that's pr actually pretty quick. Now, you've also got uh, George Weigel, who's obviously the famous biographer of John Paul II, and he wrote the, uh, the forward here to it. How did you go about getting him? Was that you, or was that the publisher, or how did that happen? Uh, neither me nor the publisher. I only know him through another friend of mine, a priest living and working in Boston, but who comes from Cameron, Father Morris. George Weigel is actually on the board of uh, uh, the Benedict Institute for Africa. So uh -huh. this priest friend of mine linked me to him and showed the manuscript and he got interested and graced the work with the foreword. Right. Now he writes in, in, in the beginning here and he mentions about the, uh, the, the Holy Father's interest, uh, John Paul II, uh, and talking about Carol's mom dying and the fact that he went to the, to the Passion Play with, him, with, his, with his dad, the three-day event in, in Poland. And he talks about the whole idea and use of suffering as a phenomenon unique to human beings. Animals feel pain, only human beings suffer. Is, is the stations important in Cameroon? Is there a lot of suffering? Is, is it just something people can relate to or what? Um, 
As a prayer community, the way of the cross is something which the Christians uh, take part in every time during Lent and also outside. But uh, it takes more meaning in the context of the crisis we have had in our country. Okay. And I'm using this work to say uh, we can learn from the lessons of Poland uh, and the lessons of John Paul II. Suffering mm -hmm. can make some people bitter, but I would like suffering to make us better mm -hmm. in that respect. And he mentions that the cross is thus an integral part of the new evangelization. We talk about the whole idea of the sign of contradiction. Uh, do you sense sometimes people are trying to, you know, get the cross out of the way and, and, and not appreciate that, that that's central to our faith? Yes, I think uh, when we do that, we are not the first. Even St. Peter, uh, if you look at Matthew chapter 16, after professing the faith of, in Christ as the Son of God, and Jesus said uh, he is going to go over to Jerusalem, he will be killed, and but on the third day he will rise, Peter tried to push him away from the right, cross. Right. So uh, it's uh, something human mm -hmm. to want to avoid suffering. If I have a headache, I will look for an aspirin, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So, But the, the point uh, George Weigel is making there, which I share, is the fact that suffering has some redemptive mm -hmm. value if mixed, if done under the banner of the cross of Christ. We are completing, in a way, in our flesh, what uh, Christ did for us on the cross. Right. Now, you write in your introduction, you, t you recount a little bit about the, you know, the 1985 visit and then the later visit in 95. You say, I knew that this developing love story was not just a set of coincidences, but an invitation for me to follow the example of his beloved Pope on my own journey toward the imitation of Christ. When did you have that realization? Um, I think it was immediately after ordination when my first assignment was to an institute of, uh, dedicated to John I Paul see. II. Right. Now you say, I find it significant that my first contribution to further the legacy of this contemporary saint is a work of popular devotion. And then you go on to mention Pigeon English version. What yes. do you mean by that? Pigeon English is a language uh, spoken in West Africa. And the way of the cross is prayed in my ecclesiastical province, the Bamenda ecclesiastical province, in Pidgin English. Oh, okay. And some of the words, uh, it's a language that has been uplifted to liturgical standards. There are actually missiles and lectionaries in hmm. Pidgin English. So uh, the ordinary uh, language of teaching, of uh, preaching on Sundays, in uh, um, even in some urban uh, parishes, is Pidgin English. Really? So uh, the way of the cross that was translated into Pidgin English is very memorable, and some of the phrases that are there are used, like catch words, like uh, memos, like even uh, for ad admonishing uh, people. So I was got inspired by that mm -hmm. to be able to write this paper. Right. You see, my aim in this little booklet is to give a new touch to this devotion and to inspire more persons to follow Christ using the life and witness of a man who himself prayed the prayer every Friday. Of his life. Mm -hmm. John Paul II prayed the way of the cross every Friday. And the intention is that uh, unlike the temptation could be after the spirit, the season of Lent to keep aside the way of the cross, I want to show in this work by using incidents from the life of John Paul II mm -hmm. to say the way of the cross is the way of life because the discipleship is basically an imitation of Christ. Now you have in here, it says about the witnesses. You know, when I first saw this, uh, the way the cross contains 14 witness testimonies, one for each station, I'm thinking, well, one is St. Peter, one's the Blessed But it's not. You, you use witnesses who illuminate uh, Carol Vautier's life, people from his life. How did you decide to do that? Uh, because of the course I had taught and I just wanted to make the way of the cross come home using real figures who met and experienced John Paul II. Some were close colleagues like his secretary, like the household nurse and some others were those he met in his travels uh, mm -hmm. like the, the characters uh, in Cameroon and also Italy, uh, Russia and so mm -hmm. I tried to give a universal dimension so that everybody from any angle uh, be uh, India, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, could be able to identify that yeah. I know the saint who right. lived in our era. Well, it's interesting because you go from Cardinal Stefan Wazinski, uh, you know, and Jan Taranowski, who's kind of that mystic, yes. to some guy who's a quarry worker. Yes. H how did you decide to, that, if, that the fifth station would be a quarry worker who Carol worked with in 1940 to 41? It's because uh, that was an important stage in the life of, uh, in the discernment of the priestly vocation of Pope John Paul II, his experience in the quarry. And in that station, we realized that uh, human work is salvific. 
uh, it has a saving dimension. Work is not only uh, a punishment of mm -hmm. due to original sin, but work is a participation in God's work of creation. Mm -hmm. So when we work, we are making ourselves also like God. Right. Another one uh, in the seventh station is a fallen away priest. Now you don't you don't mention his name, or do you mention his I don't name? Mention okay. His name. Okay. And, and why would you highlight that? It's because uh, it's a sign to show when Christ falls on the way of the cross and rises is an uh, indication mm -hmm. to us that God is a God of second chances. Right. So this priest who uh, left active ministry and uh, lost the sense of his vocation was reinstated by Pope John Paul II and it's a way to let us know there is no human sin that cannot be forgiven by God. Right, and it's also interesting, in the 8th station you actually you, you have uh, a connection to Gianna uh, Mola, Saint uh, Mola, but it's not her, it's her husband. It's her husband. Why? I'm trying to show the unity in family life and to show how um, uh, I'm portraying the glory of the uh, the, the glory of what uh, uh, Gianna Mola was able to do, but at the same time putting it on the voice of her husband who recounts the story as someone who lived it himself. Right, you have this one, the 10th, patient in a hospital in Cameroon, and then you say relationship with John Paul II, patient blessed by Pope John Paul II during the visit to Cameroon, 1985, and then in brackets it says artistic creation. Artistic creation in the sense that it's not a historical event. It's not an but individual. I, in, it's, yes, right. but since he visited and blessed people in hospital, I uh, put it up under the canopy of one of such persons. Right, okay. And then you go, on the 13th, you go to St. John Chrysostom. How did he pop up? Uh, it's because at the 13th station I'm making a connection between the Last Supper and the Calvary uh, sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So John Chrysostom is one of those uh, fathers of the church who made uh, the reference to the fact that from the side of the pierced Christ, mm -hmm. which is what happens at the 13th station, outflowed blood and water, which are symbols for the sacrament of baptism and the Eucharist. So when you went to go and put this together, obviously, over a period of time from teaching. How long did it actually take you to assemble this actually into a book? About two years, okay. two to three years, from 2015 to 2017. Did your idea behind it change as you developed it, or were you said pretty much what you wanted to do? Several times I had to rewrite some of the stations, and even uh, when I submitted to my publisher, we still reflected upon it, and I revised about one or two stations. Right. Okay. And how, what's the reception been of this book so far? Um, my friends back home in Cameroon are looking forward to this publication, mm, okay. and also uh, some members of the Cameroonian Catholic communities here in America are also hoping that uh, after this publication will be able to uh, bring it out to their audiences so that they can also uh, relieve uh, the way of the cross in their family right. setup. And, and uh, at the time of this taping, it's, it's around the time of the actually March for Life, and that's one of the reasons you came over, right? Yes. <laughs> so are you going to be at the March for Life? I will be there uh, tomorrow Friday in D.C. And why did you decide to come over for that? Uh, it's because Pope John Paul II is uh, one of the patrons of the pro-life movement and I indicate here in one of the stations at the F station that uh, human life is invaluable. Right. Human life is so important it needs to be respected from its natural conception to the natural termination. Thank you so much Father. Appreciate you stopping by uh, with this book, The Way of the Cross with St. John Paul II, published by OSV, available through the catalog. The author, Father Herbert Neva. Thank you. And I'm on set here at Napa with Stephen F. Auth, the author of a new book entitled The Missionary of Wall Street, From Managing Money to Saving Souls on the Streets of New York. Great to have you here. The first time, well, the first time we've gotten to talk. I'm a New Yorker, <laughs> uh, at least from Long Island, so I have some uh, affinity and understanding of the toughness of some of the people who uh, stalk those uh, those streets and byways there that you're dealing with. Now, how did you go from the idea of managing money to saving souls? What was that happened? Why did you think that was an important thing to put in a book? Well, uh, you know, it's important because I, I'm still operating as the chief investment officer of a major mutual fund company, mm -hmm. and I think you know, the platform that gives me is interesting. Okay. And one of the messages of the book is that all of us are called to be missionaries, mm -hmm. uh, whether we're, you know, pew Catholics or people running money on Wall Street. And I'm 
really wrote the book to try to inspire Catholics everywhere to be brave about speaking about their faith. And, and the, even and in the, a hostile right. environment like the right. streets in New York. Right. And even the idea that, like you're saying, that one doesn't have to go just to the mission fields and spend your time full time. Your, your, your mission fields are at your job and everything else. Absolutely. Right? Okay. And certainly in, in places like a, a sister, a Mother Teresa said, mm -hmm. you know, the real poverty of America Absolutely. is spiritual poverty. And certainly New York mm -hmm. has got a lot of spiritual poverty. Who's Bob and Evelyn? Bob is my fellow missionary, as is Evelyn. Evelyn's my wife, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Bob uh, and Evelyn have both been critical to building the mission uh, over the last, we've been doing this for over 10 years yeah. now, okay. Doug, yeah. Who's Sox? Sox is the name uh, I gave to, you know, the names of everyone has changed in the book, but mm -hmm. um, let's say Sox is the ex-con, the, the book opens with right. this scene. Right. And this missionary, who's me, is standing alone on a dark alley in Chinatown. It's a misty night, and he's armed with three rosaries, and he encounters an ex-con on a drug run carrying a gun. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how the reader is kind of called into the, mm -hmm. into the book. But um, something really mysterious and beautiful happens in that encounter mm -hmm. that changes both of them. I call that little story no longer alone because right. both people are alone at the start of the encounter and at the end they're forever linked in Christ. And um, you know it's one of the themes of the book is that we're called to help others and bring them back to the mm -hmm. faith which is what happens in this instance. Um, but the missionaries themselves are transformed mm -hmm. to a deeper faith through the process of being a missionary. So the day your heart stopped in 2002, Thanksgiving, you were in the hospital in Jersey, and uh, how did that impact your life? And obviously it did. Yeah, you know, Doug, I had fallen away from the faith. I was an altar boy, I grew up in a working class neighborhood in Newark, the sixth borough of New York City. Right. Uh, you know, but by the time I got out of Princeton, I had fallen away from the faith, mm -hmm. was an indifferent agnostic, became a kind of after marriage to my wife, Evelyn, became a Sunday Catholic. Right. And I suspect, like many of us, the Lord was pinging me all along um, to something more. Right. But I didn't answer. Right. So then he hit me over the head with a baseball right. bat. And that's where Father John Connor came in? Yeah, and I had my first confession in 25 years. And, you know, I came away from that. Uh, you know, Father said to me, Steve, you know, you're, you're a guy who's got, had been given a lot of talents yeah by the Lord, and you've been a very poor steward of them. And yeah, it's a wake-up call for yeah, you, right? Yeah, to answer the phone next time he called. Right. Now, you kind of jump, it jumps from, I think, 2002 to then up to 2009. What happened in between? Uh, in between was a spiritual journey, mm -hmm. which is probably another book. Uh, uh, so, you know, to go through it all, but um, I, I did missions in Mexico, and I went blind at one point, and, and things happened. but. I found a deeper spirituality, but uh, in, in, the, in the spring of 2009, in the midst of the financial crisis, the chief investment officer, a big mutual fund company, has other things to do. Right. And um, one late night, I was in Pittsburgh, I had a call from my wife, really from the Lord through her, mm -hmm. uh, to do this mission in New York. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's a little story at the beginning of the book that you're citing where the missionary says, you know, no way, no how, we're not gonna do this, it'll never work. Right. And that was my reaction, and it's also there to communicate. I think a lot of folks, they get these calls from the Lord, and then we, we discount them. Mm -hmm. You know, we come up with an excuse why it's not, it can't be real, they mm -hmm. can't be really asking me, it doesn't make any sense, I'm not qualified. And it's very prideful to think you're not qualified, because mm -hmm. the Lord doesn't call qualified people. Right. He equips people. Well, let's talk about the, the missionary of Wall Street, and, the, and the, you've got color pictures actually inside here of, uh, uh, Evelyn, the missionary in the back of the church, etc. So, w what kind of function as a missionary? What do we mean when we say, "What are these people doing?" As they're out on the street, they're behind. What are they doing? Are they in just encountering people because. Uh, yeah, we go out on the street and we've set up a net of people to do this. So it's, you know, described in the book. But basically, mm -hmm. the, you know, to put it in a nutshell, 
we're out on the streets asking people if they're Catholic. Mm -hmm. That's our opening pickup line, if you will. It's a very right. profound question. Well, how does that react? Most New Yorkers don't talk to people they don't know or they're... Yeah, they go they, buzzing they, by. Or they reach uh, for their wallet the reach first for time their somebody wallet. talks to yeah. them. Right. <laughs> but if approached with love and joy, mm -hmm. as opposed to like a preachy kind of way, mm -hmm. uh, it's incredible how many people will stop and talk to you. We've spoken now, we've greeted over 3 million people. Really? Okay. Uh, we've gotten 250,000 or so former Catholics to talk to us. Okay. And we brought 15 or 20,000 back to the oh, really? Sacrament of Confession great. for mm -hmm. the first time in a long time. And, and they had these conversion experiences. Do, do you find that, that, that you can get people the first time, or is it you go to certain locations and over a period of time the same people who go to jobs in those areas or live in those areas see you there and become more familiar or more comfortable with maybe talking to you? Uh, we definitely get people come back, Doug, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that we may have handed a rosary to. Mm -hmm. uh, th there's a story in the book of someone who uh, comes back to us after three years. And he said, you know, uh, you guys gave me a rosary three years ago. Mm -hmm. He asked me to go to the sacrament of confession. I wasn't ready, but I'm ready now. Because mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit works on it. Takes his time. time. Yeah. And but you planted the seed. To, yeah, we plant a seed. And there's a lot of what a missionary does is plant seeds. Mm -hmm. You know, we're... We're agents of the kingdom. We're not kings right. of the kingdom. We don't know where things lead. Um, but it's incredible how many people, if approached in an, an I call this radical evangelization. Mm -hmm. So if you can approach people anonymously on a street corner and a approach them lovingly and joyfully, which after all were the two key characteristics of Christians that took the Roman world by fire. Right. Uh, it attracts people. They're out in the streets in New York pursuing a lifestyle that they were told would make them happy and they're not. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of caught outside the wall. Right. What's, just before we go, what's the unforgivable sin that you talk about in the book? Uh, it's, it's what keeps a lot of people from coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they've done something that they think is unforgivable. Okay. And they're almost hoping someone uh, takes them back or helps them find a way right. back. And that's part of what we're trying to do out on the streets of New York. Well, that's terrific. The missionary of Wall Street from managing money to saving souls on the streets of New York. Thank you so much for spending time with me. Thank you, Doctor. Good luck with your book. Thank you.